Jordan Peterson is someone who, uh, I'm sure as many of you remember, uh, developed a very large reputation around 2017, 2018, uh, as the sort of intellectual mastermind titan of the right. Uh, so I, as a very left-wing person, became very interested in sort of spending time engaging with Jordan Peterson's beliefs and assessing the quality of his arguments, uh, which I have generally found to be quite lackluster. Um, if you want an example of this, um, you can go back and watch the video I did on Jordan Peterson's interpretation of the so-called gender inequality para paradox, which I think he just totally butchered the data on. Um, but in this video, I'm going to be addressing Jordan Peterson's take on a very different kind of inequality, uh, that being economic inequality. Um, I wanted to do this not just as a sort of dunk on Jordan Peterson, uh, but rather because I thought that addressing Jordan Peterson's take on this would give me an interesting opportunity to sort of develop and communicate a broader framework with regards to through what mechanisms specifically inequality is generated in a capitalist mode of production and what specific institutions and policies we can put in place to address those problems and ameliorate that inequality. Um, so yeah, I guess let's just get into it. Um, by the way, I'm not going to be stopping this video throughout. I'm just going to uh, play about three minutes of this where he makes his basic case and then address everything that he said afterwards. A good book that I would recommend reading called uh, The Great Leveler by Walter Scheidel. It's a new book, relatively new book. And he details out the, he details out the ineradicability of inequality. So part of the problem with this process that we just described where success breeds success and failure breeds failure is that the people who are succeeding get a disproportionate share of the resource pie, let's say. Um, so it, you know, everyone knows that about money, right? Because the 12 richest people in the world, the 85 richest people in the world have as much money as the bottom 2 billion, which seems, well, let's say unfair. Now, it's certainly unequal. Now, whether it's I, unfair, I believe it's Jordan, the statistic is the eight, eight richest have equal to the bottom 3.5 billion. Yeah, well, it's probably worse than it was when I looked at this about three years ago. So, but it, do, it doesn't matter because you, you, you get the point. But, but it's, um, it's but, crazy. But the thing is, is that this is not something that only applies to money. It applies to everything that's creatively produced. So the same rule applies to number of records sold by recording artists. The same rule applies to number of books sold by novelists. The same rule applies to number of goals scored by NHL hockey players. The same rule applies to the population of cities and the mass of stars and the size of trees in the, in the jungle. It's like the inequality problem is way more troublesome, again, than mere capitalism. It's a terrible problem. And Scheidel's work, which is really, really interesting, he's traced back inequality 10, 15,000 years using you can do it for example let's say you find a neolithic burial site and there's 200 people in it so these people would be buried with their possessions and obviously some of them decay but some of them don't and like some of them are buried with gold well hardly any of them and the tiny proportion of people who are bu buried with gold are buried with a lot of gold so you can even derive a Gini coefficient estimate, which is an estimate of inequality from burial sites. And it looks like as soon as you get a surplus, you get inequality. And that's a rough thing, eh? Because you might think, well, even in hunter-gatherer societies where there's no surplus, there's still inequality, because there's inequality of friendship, there's inequality of health, and there's inequality of sexual access. And those things are, they are not trivial. But when you're thinking about it purely economically, you start to get inequality as soon as you get a surplus. You think, oh, that's interesting. So there's a natural rule, which is, Surplus generates inequality. All right, so how do you solve that? And Scheidel's book says, well, that's easy. You just get rid of the surplus. Right, and that's not good. So like he, he found, and so one of the things he did was statistical analysis, because one of the things he might ask is, well, let's say you have your measures of inequality, and then you can track them around the world, and you can track whether or not the inequality is generated by a right-wing government or a left-wing government. 
and then you might hope, well, the left-wing governments would ameliorate inequality. There's no evidence for that at all. It doesn't look like inequality is with, it, it doesn't look like the amelioration of inequality is within the purview of political organization. Yeah. And, and you should, yeah. like, you should not hear that with any degree of happiness whatsoever, because... Okay, so, um... That's his basic take. There's sort of three main arguments that he made there that I want to address. Um, the first argument he made is that, you know, inequality goes much deeper than sort of the economic domain. We can see inequality in terms of, you know, how many uh, or which NHL hockey players score the most goals, which authors sell the most books. There's sort of inequality in all of these different domains. Um I find this to be a very weird argument uh, because I could very easily concede that inequality exists in all of these domains, um, but the fundamental question is whether or not we necessarily have to um, distribute our economic resources in a way which is in accordance with that and is similarly unequal. Um, I would argue that you know the entire point of structures that we've set up, like taxation and redistribution, is that we now have the institutions such that the end result of how economic resources are distributed in society does not have to conform to the sort of inequality which is generated by the sort of quote-unquote natural market mechanisms that Jordan Peterson is referring to. Um, so yeah, I, I just don't think that follows at all. Um, like th these are two different kinds of inequality. Inequality in terms of outcomes with regards to merit in different areas and inequality uh, with regards to how economic resources are distributed are, are two different kinds of inequality. And I don't think that the second kind of inequality is necessitated or required by the first kind of inequality. Um, or at least Jordan Peterson didn't lay out a case as to why that is. Um, so um, the second argument that he made is similarly very strange to me, uh, because he essentially just said that we've had large levels of inequality ever since we've developed a surplus. So therefore, if we are going to keep having the surplus, we have to keep having the inequality. But and again, but again, I just don't think that really follows. Um, in fact, Marx talks about this a lot. This is a key component of historical materialism, which is that the development of a surplus gave rise to the development of class society. Um, first, we had slave society, where um, society was divided into the classes of master and slave. Then we had feudal society, where society was divided into lord and serf. And now we have capitalist society, where society is div uh, divided into capitalist and worker, bourgeoisie and proletariat, um, employer and employee, however you want to say it. Um, and But what Marx realized is that just because historically the surplus led to this class structure, that doesn't mean that the surplus can't exist without a class structure, right? Um, this would be like um, this would be like if I were to you know go up to the person who invented a car. Let's say I lived when cars were first being invented, and I went up to the person who invented a car, and I was like, "Huh." Throughout all of human history, we have never had cars, and now all of the sudden, you think we can just start driving cars? That's ridiculous. Um, or like, you know, if we want to talk about in terms of, um, you know, social structures, I could go up to when the state was first created, I could go up to the people in society at the time when the concept of a government first took hold and say, whoa, throughout all of human history, we've never had governments. And now all of a sudden, you think we can just create governments? Um, it's like, I, I, you could go and do this for a variety of different things, right? But the problem is just because up to this point we haven't had a certain thing, it does not follow that we can't have that thing, right? The history of human civilization is humans creating and inventing new things and structures and institutions, which up till that point we had never had before. Um, so that's just a very strange argument to me. Um, the final argument that he made, which I think is the most prescient, is essentially that 
you know, according to Scheidel's work, I, I did a little bit of research into this. Um, Scheidel references a study where um, if you look across, uh, if, or if you look across different countries, um, he took a sample of different countries and found that the countries which were ruled by left-wing governments did not have a substantially lower amount of inequality or didn't do a great job at substantially reducing inequality compared to the countries with the right-wing governments. Um, And from there, Jordan Peterson is now concluding that the amelioration with inequality is outside of the purview of the political domain. Um, But I think if that's the claim that you're trying to prove, that methodology is a very weird one to use. Um, especially when we have papers like this study by French economist Thomas Piketty, whose name I probably am completely butchering. Um, this study this study is called Brahmin Left versus Merchant Right, Rising Inequality in the Changing Structure of Political Conflict. Um, if you want to read the entire study, I'll link it in the description. Um, I'll just read from the abstract. Uh, Using post-electoral surveys from France, Britain, and the U.S., this paper documents a striking long-run evolution in the structure of political cleavages. In the 1950s to 1960s, the vote for left-wing parties was associated with lower education and lower-income voters. It has gradually become associated with higher-education voters, giving rise to a multiple elite party system in the 2000s to 2010s. High-education elites now vote for the left, while high-income, high-wealth elites still vote for the right. I argue that this can contribute to explain rising inequality and the lack of democratic response to it, as well as the rise in populism. Uh, So basically, the point that Thomas Piketty goes on to make in this paper is that perhaps the reason why democratic societies and even left-wing governments have failed to ameliorate inequality to a very significant degree is because in many countries, even the left-wing governments have been sort of captured by the interests of different groups of elites and have largely strayed from the interests of poor and working-class people. Uh, Even if this wasn't the case, I could still say, you know, maybe the reason why left-wing governments, many left-wing governments, have failed to substantially reduce inequality is because... um, They just haven't, by and large, been implementing the right policy. For example, many countries, like the U.S., have left-wing governments whose main focus in terms of redistributive policy is more sort of targeted, means-tested policies. Um, And there's a variety of papers. If you want more information on this, look up the Paradox of Redistribution, which suggests that this sort of more targeted approach results in substantially less net redistribution and less amelioration of inequality as opposed to a more universal uh, uh, approach to welfare, uh, which is shunned in the dialogue um, in many countries, even in in the left-wing parties. Um, Or, you know, even just besides that, I could say, you know, a lot of the policies that I would propose that I think are very crucial to alleviating inequality just don't exist even in most left-wing countries. Um, like a social wealth fund would be an example of this. Um, the only country that really has a substantial social wealth fund, which I think is key to ameliorating inequality, is Norway. Um, so, yeah, um, there, there's just a variety of problems with this approach. Uh, that Jordan Peterson is using to make this point, or or not Jordan Peterson, but Scheidel, that Peterson is referencing. Um, The much better approach that seems to make more sense to me would be to look at specific policies and say, okay, have we seen specific policies that seem to pretty substantially reduce uh, income inequality? And when you take that approach, um, the results are much less pessimistic. It seems all of the sudden, when you start looking at that, that um, the amelioration of inequality is within the purview of the political domain. Um, But before I get into demonstrating that empirically, I want to do what I said I was going to do earlier, which is sort of try and build out a broader framework in terms of the origins and solutions to inequality uh, within a capitalist society. Um, So... Before we understand why capitalism generates inequality, we have to understand how capitalism distributes resources. Um, And by and large, capitalism distributes resources based on factor productivity. In other words, capitalism distributes resources based on uh, capital and labor. So you can earn money by doing labor, 
or you can earn money by owning capital. Um, so the reason why this organization uh, generates a lot of inequality is for a few reasons. Um, for one, um, about half of all people do not work, right? So if you put together people or, or if you compile sort of people who are too young to work, too old to work, too disabled to work, people who are caretakers and are busy taking care of, uh, you know, sick or disabled loved ones and therefore can't work, people who are in school and therefore can't work, um, etc. These groups of people comprise about 50% of the population. So when we have a situation where about half of all people can't work and therefore can't earn any money, unless we have some alternative mechanisms of distributing money towards these people outside of the market, this is going to generate a lot of inequality. The second reason is because even among people who do work, different groups of workers can earn massively different wages, right? There can be very large divides in terms of the wages of different groups of workers, which generates a lot of inequality. Um, and the third problem is that capital, which is the other source of factor income, uh, is distributed very unevenly. By and large, the vast majority of capital in the United States is owned by a very tiny percentage of people. And when you have that capital generating trillions and trillions of dollars every year, and all of that capital income is going to a small percentage of the population, obviously that's going to generate a lot of inequality. Um, so with this general framework in mind, we can sort of start to see very obvious, simple solutions to inequality. Um, for one, you can simply distribute money uh, to non-workers through welfare, uh, through things like universal child allowance, things like social security, things like... Um, you know, universal child care, universal pre-K, unemployment insurance, etc. Um, so that, you know, the half of all people who can't work are still getting an income. Uh, you can compress wages between different groups of workers through something like sectoral centralized union bargaining. Um, centralized union bargaining also has the effect of lowering inequality because it um, brings more money into the uh, cap or the labor income pool as opposed to the capital income pool. Um, you can additionally uh, make sh uh, make it so that the ownership of capital and the people who are benefiting from capital income is more spread out rather than just being a tiny percentage of the population. Uh, the mechanism through which you could do this would be a social wealth fund um, where through which the government essentially creates a fund, uh, buys up stocks, buys up real estate, um, buys up income generating assets, um, and slowly eats up a larger and larger percent of the nation's capital so that you know those trillions of dollars in capital income are no longer going to private capital owners but to the state which then redistributes that capital income among the population as a whole um, so yeah um, we can very clearly see once we have a good framework uh, exactly the kinds of things we could do to solve inequality um, but of course, I generally don't like to leave things at the theoretical level. I like to try and substantiate everything I say with data whenever possible. Um, and conveniently, there is a lot of data suggesting that everything I'm saying here uh, is true. So, um, for example, I'll put the links to all of these uh, sources in the description. Uh, for example, if you look at the correlation across uh, several countries, uh, between net public social spending, so just kind of like welfare, and uh, post-transfer Gini coefficients, um, which is just a measure of inequality, we can see that there is a very, very strong correlation between more social spending and lower income inequality across different countries. Uh, but if you want to go beyond just sort of raw cross-sectional data sets like this one and sort of get into a more nuanced and uh, uh, complex statistical analysis on this relationship, um, we can look at this study uh, titled Social Spending, Generosity, and Income Inequality, a Dynamic Panel Approach. Um, again, I'm just going to read the abstract. Uh, 
Um, if you want to read the whole study, I'll link it in the description. This paper explores if more generous social spending policies in fact lead to less income inequality or if redistributive outcomes are offset by behavioral disincentive effects. To account for the inherent endogeneity of social policies with regards to inequality levels, I applied the system GMM estimator and used the presumably random incidence of certain diseases as instruments for social spending levels. The regression results suggest that more social spending effectively reduces inequality levels. The result is robust with respect to the instrument count and different data restrictions. Looking at the structure of benefits, particularly unemployment benefits and public pensions are responsible for the inequality reducing impact. More targeted benefits, however, do not significantly reduce income inequality. Rather, their positive effect on pre-government income inequality hints at substantial disincentive effects. Um, so we can see, even when we apply more complicated statistical analysis methods, um, we see that there is a very robust uh, correlation uh, and causal relationship between more social spending and less income inequality. Uh, besides social spending, another thing that I referenced was unions, and similarly, we can see that there seems to be a pretty robust relationship between union membership and inequality. Uh, for example, this uh, chart from the Economic Policy Institute shows that essentially as uh, union membership was very low starting around 1917, income inequality was also very uh, high. And then as union membership rapidly rose, income inequality massively fell. And then over the past several decades, as union membership has been falling again, income inequality has been rising again. So it seems like there is a pretty unmistakable relationship between these two variables. Um, in the U.S. at least, it seems that historically union membership massively reduced economic inequality. And it's been the decline in union membership that uh, is largely responsible for the increase that we've been seeing. Um, and, and inequality. Um, again, if you want to just go beyond like bare statistical correlations and look at more complex analysis, as I think is necessary, um, we can look at this study titled Unions and Inequality Over the 20th Century, New Evidence from Survey Data. Um, the abstract says, U.S. U.S. income inequality has varied inversely with union density over the past hundred years, but moving beyond this aggregate relationship has proven difficult, in part because of limited microdata on union membership prior to 1973. We develop a new source of microdata on union membership dating back to 1936, survey data primarily from Gallup, to examine the long-run relationship between unions and inequality. We document dramatic changes in the demographics of union members. When density was at its mid-century peak, union households were much less educated and more non-white than other households, whereas pre-World War II and today, they are more similar to non-union households on these dimensions. However, despite large changes in composition and density since 1936, the household union premium holds relatively steady between 10 and 20 log points. We then use our data to examine the effect of unions on income inequality. Using distributional decomposition time series regressions, state year regressions, as well as a new instrumental variable stra strategy based on the 1935 legalization of unions and the World, uh, World War II era labor board, we find consistent evidence that unions reduce inequality, explaining a significant share of the dramatic fall in inequality between the mid-1930s and late 1940s. Um, so again, it seems like there is uh, robust evidence suggesting that uh, more union membership has a causal relationship with significantly lower income inequality. Um, now, the last thing I referenced, um, a social wealth fund, there isn't a lot of comprehensive studies on because there's really only one country which has a notable large social wealth fund, uh, that being Norway. Um, and so there obviously isn't a lot of like you know, studies on that uh, and its relationship with inequality. But there are certain uh, anecdotes and case studies that we can look at from Norway's experience with, uh, with its social wealth fund that show us that a social wealth fund is a uh, viable and uh, effective strategy at combating income inequality. Uh, and one of these case studies uh, can be seen in the recent coronavirus pandemic and how it's affected uh, Norway versus, you know, the U.S. 
uh, or any other country which has large amounts of private capital ownership and low rates of social capital ownership. Um, so this is a good article from uh, Matt Brunig titled Norway State Ownership During the Pandemic. Um, so first he references his paper, Social Wealth Fund for America, which is a really great paper that I recommend everyone go read. Um, and then he says, the argument of that paper is that the U.S. government should create a new investment fund called the American Solidarity Fund, give every American one non-transferable share of ownership in the fund, and then gradually move the nation's wealth out of private ownership and into the social wealth fund. This would radically reduce wealth inequality and redirect the nation's capital away from the rich towards the masses. Norway's experience in the pandemic proves how effective this strategy could be. In Norway, the central government owns a very large share of the national wealth, primarily through a social wealth fund called the Government Pension Fund Global. Last week, the administrators of so Norway's social wealth fund released its performance figures from the year. In 2020, the social wealth fund had a 10.9% rate of return, beat its benchmark index by 0.27 percentage points, and generated a total return of 1 trillion NOK, which is slight equal to slightly more than $20,000 per Norwegian. So just as the owners of wealth in the U.S. scored a major windfall last year, so too did the owners of wealth in Norway. The difference is that in Norway, the majority of the wealth is owned publicly, whereas in the U.S., almost all of it is owned privately. Um, so basically, the point of this is that over the course of the coronavirus pandemic, owners of capital uh, uh, have seen large uh, increases in the amount of money that they're receiving as a function of uh, capital income. Uh, in the U.S., that means that a very tiny minority of the population, which is already rich, has gotten significantly richer, um, while basically everyone else in the general population has suffered. Um, however, in Norway, because they have a social wealth fund where the government has been gradually eating up a larger and larger percentage of the nation's capital, that increase in capital income didn't just go to a tiny minority of the population, but rather a lot of it went to the state um, in terms of uh, uh, in the form of increased revenue for the state, uh, which the state then redistributes to the population as a whole through social welfare and so on. Um, so, um, yeah, this just seems like an interesting case study in how effective social wealth funds can be at uh, addressing the inequality problem. Um, so, yeah, I think that's generally all I wanted to say. Um, I just think that all of Jordan Peterson's arguments haven't really demonstrated in any way that we can't address inequality through political action. And when we have a, you know, very basic understanding of why inequality exists within capitalism, we can see very clearly that there are policies we can do to address these issues. And um, the data furthermore corroborates that, um, these policies do have this effect. Um, so yeah, that's basically all I wanted to say. Um, again, obligatory shout out to my $10 patrons, that being Alex, Daniel, Benny, Isocratic, Liam Dekami, Hate Corruption, CEO of Market Socialism, Zero, Raven, and other Alex. Um, if you're interested in supporting me, I have a Patreon where I upload exclusive essays and stuff. So um, if you want to uh, consume more content that I produce, um, check that out. I'll link it in the description. Um, otherwise, yeah, thanks for watching.